so uh, thank you very much, uh, Ilan. Um, our next uh, speaker is Diego Sankin. Where is he? Ah, oh, here he's coming. So he's uh, one of our community members, and uh, he's a guidance and navigation, guidance navigation and control engineer at uh, Astroscale. Uh, but he's going to talk about a uh, PhD uh, work that he did and was accepted. Master degree, sorry, and it was accepted also in uh, ICRA, right? But back then, uh, a very interesting work he did. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Diego. I'm going to talk about um, a couple of projects I worked on, and I want to thank the Israeli robotics community and especially Amit for hosting me and allowing me giving me the platform to share what I worked on. Uh, what do we? Okay. Space. Okay, so wildfires. Woo! Okay, um, there's a big discussion whether wildfires should be fought or not. But the fact is that in the last, there's a very clear trend in the last few years that wildfires are becoming becoming more frequent and more intense. This is because mostly of uh, global change, uh, climate change, that makes a very prolonged drought. Now. Drones are being used to fight wildfires, but only on secondary tasks. Like monitoring, detecting the wildfires, maybe even logistics for the firefighters, um, but not in the main task, which is extinguishing the flames. And my project, when I, when I started working with it, I was, uh, studying, was studying for my master's and I was looking for a topic, and we still had the trauma here a couple of years before. There were big, big bushfires in the Carmel, if you remember. And I remember all the air forces of the world sending their aid to Israel, and I was like, why are they not sending swarms of drones 24-7? It seems that it's more complicated than that. So I started working on the, all this crazy idea, and uh, in the university told me, relax. This is just a master's thesis. So since my field of expertise was uh, path planning and control and all that, so I, I moved into the, um, the trajectory to tackle these fires. Now, arriving to wildfire uh, quickly, is, um, it's of uttermost importance in order to, to avoid that a small and manageable fire will become a mega fire. Um, and, uh, so we have two types of uh, fire for air firefighting. Air firefighting, we have two types of aircraft, uh, wind, airplanes, or um, all the, the uh, rotary wing, which is all the copter, like helicopter, multicopter, etc., etc. Uh, not, we don't use multicopters now, but you will see why. Um, so, current manned firefighting is extremely expensive because you have to have very skilled pilots and trained all the time, and it's ex extremely, extremely dangerous. These maneuvers, like, because of the sloshing of the water inside the airplanes, they can stall. Uh, in, in addition to all that, they cannot operate in bad weather at night or, or any bad, uh, bad visibility conditions. Now, Fixed wing aircraft are more efficient in anything related to payload. They can carry a larger payload faster and to longer distance. But uh, rotary wing aircraft have the big advantage that they can scoop water from any concentration of water, any pond, even a pool. Whereas fixed wing aircraft need very large extensions of calm water in order to scoop water. Uh, the same goes for dropping, by the way. Um, Airplanes cannot properly drop water on any terrain, whereas helicopters can. And the team I was working on, the, the university, they work with multicopters, so it's a good, um, it's a good match. So what we want to do is actually to enable a UAV to drop a relatively large amount of uh, water or any fire retardant precisely on a fire focus and to drop it as close as possible. Why do we want to drop it as close as possible? Let us imagine you want to. Uh, let's imagine you want to drop water on a fire. So you fly above it, drop the water, and that's it. But if you drop it from very high above, the water will either evaporate or disperse, or both of them actually. If you drop it too low, you are in danger of burning the aircraft, right? You're exposing it to very high temperatures and it will damage its structure, unless you do it very, very quick. Think about you holding a candle and passing your finger the flame. If you pass your finger quick enough, you will barely feel the heat, right? So, 
if we have um, if we want to do this with a with a drone, we have a, a problem that is it could be like a short blanket problem, right? A drone, in order to move forward, has to deal its whole body. But in order to maintain flight, you need that at any given moment, the vertical component of the thrust will be equal or larger than the combined weight of the drone and the payload. So the problem is that if you if you want to drop the, pay, the payload very low, that means you have to fly fast. But it means you can take only carry a small amount of water. On the other hand, if you want to carry a large amount of water, it means you can fly very slow, so you have to drop it very high. Can we can we um, make some compromise? And the idea is that yes, if we actually disregard the need of maintaining flight. If we imagine engaging in a very risky maneuver, you can tilt the drone, even 90 degrees, and exploit all the thrust to accelerate forward. The drone is falling. It's totally falling, but it's also accelerating. At some point, you drop the water on the fire, on the, you drop the water, you make sure that the moment you drop it, it will uh, hit the fire. You have to drop it in the exact location. And then, but now you're light and you can recover. If you think about it, when I started um, searching for literature to deal with mass variations, all the existing literature was about mitigating the effects of mass variation, considering mass as disturbance. But what we do here is it, actually exploiting the expected variation in mass to our uh, advantage. We, we are able to recover because the drone is light later. So um, we approach the, we approach the um, the problem as an optimal control problem, in which uh, we generate a time series of, um, of state vectors, which include the position and velocity and the tilt angle of the drone on different time, uh, time uh, along a trajectory on different time steps, um, the heading angle of the whole maneuver, and the releasing signal. Uh, what we want to minimize here is the overall time of the trajectory. And at the dropping point, we want to minimize the altitude and maximize the horizontal speed. The constraint we have is, of course, in order to go through this trajectory, we have to obey the dynamic model of the drone. We cannot do anything. It has to match the physics. Um, we have to make sure that the payload, once released, it follows a perfect ballistic trajectory and hits the target. Uh, we have all kinds of, uh, well, after finishing the trajectory, of course, we have to avoid colliding with the terrain. That means we have to be at a higher altitude and rising. And through, through all the whole trajectory, we want to avoid a minimum height above the ground to make sure we're not colliding as a safety measure. So uh, this is the result of the optimization. As I, this is the, the shape of the, of the path. It's actually not something I designed is the outcome of the optimizer. What I just told you before about tilting the drone, it was my imagination. But after describing the problem to the, to the optimizer, this, was the real, this really was the outcome, not surprisingly. We um, divide the trajectory into three phases. The first phase, the red one, is the approach phase in which we are accelerating and falling. The green phase is the, where we are releasing the payload. And the black phase is the recovery. Um, the solution for this, uh, I described the whole problem in, in, a, in 2D, on a plane, right? And the reason is to make it to, uh, this, because of this dimensionality, the problem because, becomes much smaller and much more manageable. So the optimizer is able to output the solution much, much quicker, and it allows the future implementation into a model predictive control. For those of you who don't know, model predictive control consists in mostly recalculating a trajectory and executing one or a few steps and recalculating it and updating the trajectory over time. Okay? Uh, so in order to still provide a 3D solution, what we do is we can rotate this whole plane. Um, we take into consideration environmental parameters. This is not done in, you know, the, the joke about the, the spheric horse. This is not done in the... Uh, uh, yeah. Exactly, in vacuum. This is not done in vacuum. We take into account uh, aerodynamic drag uh, and uh, terrain gradient. Of course, it's not like a real terrain gradient, but it has to be like a smooth surface, but it can have any orientation in its tilt. And I uh, also consider different releasing mechanisms. The first would be like dropping a balloon or a 
container with water. The second would be a, um, a constant flux pump. And the third would be like having some kind of container with a hole on the bottom. Now, after we did all this, uh, all this simulation, the, uh, the, the results at the end were very similar to each other. So when we had to proceed for further experiments, we chose to do only the set and releasing weights at, um, at, at an instant. So first we did some simulations in MATLAB, then we proceeded to Gazebo, and at last we did two test campaigns in a test range uh, in the outskirts of Prague. Uh, the first one was more mild with higher safety measures. We actually dropped from a higher distance at a lower speed, uh, we incrementally rise the amount the weight. And it was mostly to make sure that we are not going to crash and that um, and to identify sources of error. For example, these disks we were using, they sometimes they glided. Or because of the high rotational speed, sometimes they threw the disks away. But after we had identified all the sources, so we turned all these switches off. The, the guys at the university were like, are you sure you're doing this? Yeah, yeah. So we allow the drone to tilt like actually 90 degrees and fly extremely fast. Uh, dropping their weight, um, and in order to prove that we actually have the most extreme maneuvers we could possibly have, the last test was simulating a malfunction in the releasing mechanism to prove that it is so extreme that if we cannot release the payload, we actually cannot recover. They did we crash on purpose a drone uh, on the last test. Uh, these results, after we we published them. Um, yeah, they got us to the robotic and automation letters for the year 2020, and also to the, the international conference in robotic and automation. Uh, the payload was very large; it was about a quarter of the overall weight. Uh, with that, we managed to drop. Uh, we managed to achieve velocities 90 percent higher, almost twice higher than the nominal speed of the drone. Uh, we dropped at 12 meters, and even then, we got an average standard deviation of, uh, of droppings of left, less than about two meters. So yeah, that's it, and that brings me to my second project. Um, after coming back, after the publication, everything, I was approached by an acquaintance that works in a drone delivery company, I'm not going to say which one, uh, but they say they have this problem that if, if you have, like, like in Zeeman, you have like a fixed wing aircraft dropping, they cannot drop very accurately. So that's why most of the drone deliveries that have to deploy payloads very, very accurately, they do it with drones, multi-copters, or for example, these hybrid things. The problem they have is that the whole drone has to be designed for the peak, uh, for the peak uh, power consumption, right? And they, all these minutes that they hold either over or land, they consume a lot of power, and their, then their um, active radius gets reduced. They get, they, they get very limited. So. But what they asked me is basically I could come up with an idea of, of laying the payload very smoothly and very quickly without having the need to hover above. So the idea I came up with is um, it's an evolution of the algorithm I just presented before. Imagine that you're flying and approaching the dropping location a few tens of meters before you extend the payload. Uh, you extend it with the tether, like let's say a wire, or you fly with the thing hanging. And you start inducing oscillations on it by accelerating and decelerating. And you can coordinate the movement of the drone in such a manner that at, so at the moment the payload, the pendulum, the payload is touching the dropping point, it will touch the ground at zero speed, zero vertical, zero horizontal. And then you cut the tether, release it, and you keep flying. So yeah, I did all the all the modeling. Cannot <laughs> take you this works. I mean I didn't try it uh, on a physical platform but on simulations what you was, was going to show you is not an animation it's a real simulation 
uh, taking into account also aerodynamic drag. Uh, the dynamic model can also be adapted for fixed wing aircraft, not only for rotary wing. And it also can be adapted not to a fixed point, but to a moving platform, like a ship, a vessel, or a car. And it's patent pending. You will have to believe me. Um, the reason why you saw the, the, the box, the blue box, the, the payload, whatever, being um, dragged backwards is because of uh, the aerodynamic drag. If you change these different parameters, you may in fact induce oscillations, real oscillations. It really depends on the, 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 the ballistic coefficient of the payload and the, the atmospheric pressure, etc., etc. Uh, of course, you have to provide a feasible set of parameters, right? If we try to imagine this being a jumbo jet, trying with a 30 centimeters wire, trying to make this be between the buildings of Manhattan, it will not work. But uh, there's a certain set of parameters, most of them, that uh, it actually works pretty fine. What about the drone posture? It seems like a ground spot. Yeah, it's probably giving maximum thrust. I can, one of the constraints I can limit is the maximum thrust. So for, of course, I want to leave some margin to allow it to maneuver. But it depends on the weight you put on the drone and the, uh, the thrust to weight ratio. So yeah, it was too good, so I patented it. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the presentation. Yeah, that one. So yeah, thank you. Questions? Questions? Yes. Uh, based on the video which you showed, you can see the blue box kind of wobbling towards the end of the landing. What about if the parcel or the payload has sensitive equipment, something fragile, which can not withstand these kind of movements? Uh, Okay, it, um, I dropped it on purpose about uh, 20 centimeters below. Know, that's what probably wobbling. It's not wobbling, it's hanging from a pendulum and it uh, does not suffer, because it's a pendulum, it does not feel any sideways uh, G's, only towards uh, upwards. And it's very, very small, extremely small. Like uh, I was fantasizing when I tried this, I tried to lay a, a glass of wine when I'm having a meal or something, I just like a glass of wine and keeps flying. That's what I was, what I was driven on. I'm just imagining the pizza going sliding all over. No, it's not sliding. The, the thing is, the bit, it feels all the time G going upwards. It never fits any, any zero acceleration on Sorry? There's always inertia. No, because it's a pendulum. So it's always, hang, the, the acceleration is always towards the, the, the wire. If it's a wire. Of course, if you're using some kind of actuated robotic arm or something like that, you can't generate oscillations, uh, acceleration sideways. Yeah. 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 Yeah